Hi. The next four shows of Life, Death, and the Space Between podcast will be a four-part series. The first two parts will be with Dr. Robert Schwartz discussing your soul's plan and your soul's gift and the concept of pre-birth planning. The third show will be a show all about past life regression with Michelle Brock, who's a past life regression therapist. And then the fourth show is going to be me telling you all about my past life regression, my experience with it, what I learned, how I found it helpful or not helpful. So please tune in to hear this four-part series. Today, I'm back again with part two of my four-part series, and this is the second part with Robert Schwartz, author of Your Soul's Plan and Your Soul's Gift. So if you didn't have a chance yet, start with part one, which was last Thursday, and and then listen to this part so you can kind of have a sense of what we're talking about. If you jump in today, it probably will be a little confusing to you. Last week might have even been confusing to you, but um, start there. And here's just a little background about Robert Schwartz. In a personal session with a medium in 2003, author Robert Schwartz was astonished to speak with non-physical beings who knew everything about him, not just what he had done in life, but also what he had thought and felt. They told him that he had had planned many of his most difficult experiences before he was born. Realizing that a knowledge of pre-birth planning would bring great healing to people and allow them to understand the deeper purpose of life's challenges, he devoted the next three years to studying the pre-birth plans of dozens of individuals. The extraordinary insights that emerged speak to our heartfelt, universal yearning to know why. I'm excited to welcome back Robert Schwartz to Life, Death, and the Space Between podcast today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back. Can you uh, tell me a little bit? So last week we were talking about the soul group or tribe making decisions wholly to raise the vibration of the planet. So I wanted to get back to the individual here for a minute. Do you have a choice to heal a trauma in this life before you have to experience the trauma? You do have an option through your free will to heal something before it generates some kind of suffering in your life. Uh, in the first interview with you, we, I talked about a hypothetical example of somebody named Sally who had a number of past lives in which she made certain plans. And then when she got into body, she didn't follow them. She let other people tell her how to live her life. And then she resolved, after seeing that tendency in her life review, to bring it back into body for the purpose of healing it. That kind of thing happens all the time. At the end of every incarnation, we have a life review where we evaluate, did we learn what we came to learn and what can we do better? And then we base the plan for the next lifetime on those life reviews. So you bring back into body energetically certain tendencies that you would like to overcome or heal or rise above, and you plan certain challenges that are intended to give you both the opportunity and the motivation to heal those underlying tendencies, but you have free will. So if you use your free will to learn the underlying lesson or heal whatever it is you are trying to heal, then the plan challenges don't need to happen, and then they don't happen. Mm -hmm. So how many major lessons do we typically have to learn in our life? Like, are there, <clears throat> excuse me, are there sort of like a chalkboard of these are the big lessons that people need to learn? I know ultimately is love, but you know, you, you gave the example of um, last week with Sally and George, she needed to learn standing up for herself, standing up to others, not bowing to the wish of others, which is, a sort of a subtitle of loving yourself, right? <laughs> Are there big overarching themes and we pick three of them for this life that we really are going to kind of nail down and then there might be many ones to get there? I mean, is it like a classroom in that sense? Earth is very much a school. It's a school for your soul. Right. Um, 
I should explain for your listeners, in Your Soul's Plan and Your Soul's Gift, I examined people's pre-birth plans by working with very gifted mediums and channels who in one way or another could access that kind of information. And one of the mediums has the ability to hear the conversations we have with each other before we're born. So I had the opportunity to go into dozens and dozens of pre-birth planning sessions and hear the conversations that were taking place when big challenges were being planned. And what I noticed over a period of time is that a lot of the discussion revolved around the soul's desire to cultivate and then express while in body certain qualities that are important to the soul. And I gave these qualities the name divine virtues. And over a period of time, I put together a list of the ones that came up the most often. There are now, I think, 28 on the list. It's things like patience, empathy, forgiveness, unconditional love, um, peace, joy, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And you are correct when you said three uh, main lessons, because what I found is the average person is working on two or three of the virtues in a lifetime. And you will work on those virtues over an arc of lifetimes, many incarnations, until you feel complete with them, and then you go on to mastering some of the other virtues. So it is generally two or three major lessons. And so is an old soul and a new soul, what is your concept of that? Like, does it, Is an old soul, I think often people think an old soul is someone who has been has been here before but is it because they're not getting the lessons they're supposed to get i i actually heard brian say something that changed that shifted all told completely how i saw old soul new soul which was like maybe the new souls are the ones that actually get it and the old souls are the ones that aren't getting it so much well that, that actually is possible uh sometimes <laughs> when we talk about an old soul uh, it's somebody who has not been learning the lessons that they wanted to learn. And so they're coming back again and again in multiple incarnations working on the same lessons. Um, generally, when I, when I think of young soul versus old soul, it, there's a difference in the type of lessons that are being learned. There's a body of channel literature referred to as the Michael system. Michael here is not a reference to Archangel Michael. Michael is the name of a group consciousness, a collective that has channeled a lot of information about life plan relative to soul age. In the Michael system, there are, I think, five or six ages for souls, and it's something like infant, young, middle-aged, mature, and old. According to Michael, young souls who have not been on Earth very much are interested in exploring issues of physical survival. They'll incarnate in a place like Africa that lends itself to that. When you move up, uh, a notch in terms of soul age to uh, young. Young souls are interested in exploring issues of power. According to Michael, they incarnate in a place like the United States that lends itself to that kind of exploration. And certainly we see a lot of that going on now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that could be yeah. a whole nother like podcast, not just one podcast, but an entire. Yeah. I know. You know. Then you when you get, but when you get to, to mature and old, according to the Michael system, those souls are interested in exploring emotions, psychological issues, relationships. Uh, the oldest souls, according to Michael, are incarnating in what we were considered to be new age cities in the U.S., Asheville, North Carolina, Crestone, Colorado, Sedona, Arizona, Ashland, Oregon. And they're also in the Scandinavian countries, uh, Poland and Switzerland, I believe. And I'm not sure what the reason is for that. But they do tend to congregate in certain places in the world. So essentially, according to this system, uh, the type of life plan you choose before you were born depends very much on soul age. And is that, can you talk a, a bit more about what the new age souls are working on? Uh, or the most mature, I, saying, I think you, you meant, and new age places, I think you said. Yes. Yeah, the, the mature and old souls, according to the Michael system, are exploring emotions, psychological issues, and relationships. That's their focus. So they're creating life plans before they come into body that allow them to explore those topics. And what is it about the places that they are that lends itself to that? The location? That, that's a very good question. I, I think some of it simply has to do with wanting to be with other souls who are more or less the same stage of evolution. So they're incarnating in certain 
cities or certain countries where they will be around each other. Uh, there's probably more to it than that. I have, I'm not an expert in the Michael system, but I think that's one reason. Okay. I'm going to add that to my list of people to talk to. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, in the book you pose the question, is it true in general that a personality can learn certain lessons in perhaps less painful ways? And if those lessons are not learned, the challenges become greater. So we talked a little bit about this in the last podcast, but can you, how, how do we ensure that we're learning our lessons? Like if it's some, if something's coming at you, how do you make sure that you get it the first time? So you don't have to keep experiencing it. This would be very helpful for my clinical work. I have to say. Well, in order to get it the first time around, you obviously would have to see it. You would have to recognize and know what the lesson is. And the first time it comes around, that may or may not be clear to you. Now, when the same kind of challenge comes back around in increasingly intense form, then people start to piece it together. I'll share an interesting story with you. A number of years ago, I worked with a woman who at the time was in her 40s, and she shared with me the following true story that had taken place when she'd been in her 20s. She and her daughter, who at that time was seven years old, were at a swimming pool during the summer. This woman was lying in a lounge chair in the sun. The little girl was playing in the water in the pool. Well, all of a sudden, the little girl jumped up, ran over to her mother, and said, you're not waking up the way we planned before we were born, so you're going to have to have a really bad accident. Well, the mother was horrified, partly because her daughter was saying such a strange thing, <laughs> partly at the idea of having to have an accident. But sure enough, not long thereafter, she had a car accident which did not trigger a spiritual awakening. Then about a year later, she had a second and even worse car accident which did not trigger a spiritual awakening. About a year later, she had a third and even worse car accident which finally triggered a spiritual awakening. So you notice that the third car accident is worse than the second, and the second is worse than the first. That kind of pattern is what we were talking about in the first interview, where I said if something comes back in increasingly intense form, pay close attention. It's your soul really trying to get you to notice something. This woman was here to have a spiritual awakening. That was one of her intentions in this lifetime. She wasn't doing it on her own. That triggered the first car accident. She still didn't get it. That triggered the second. She still didn't get it. And that triggered the third. And then finally, she woke up. Now, I don't want people to go into fear about that. That's exactly the opposite of what I want. But just be aware that there often is that kind of pattern when your soul is trying to get you to learn a certain lesson. Well, and I think the psychology behind that, when I hear you saying that, is there's such a there's such a push right now for mindfulness and and all of that. But it really is about being conscious and present in your life. So when these things are presented to you, you can see them and respond appropriately for your soul's growth. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And that is one of the great advantages of mindfulness. I think it, you know, when you're mindful, when you're fully present, you see deeply. And part of seeing deeply is seeing the underlying spiritual meaning and purpose of the challenging things that are happening. If you're not present, then you tend to miss that. So when this, with this woman, if when her daughter said that to her, she would have been like, I got to wake up. You know, she's obviously telling me something. The first car accident might not have happened. There's a very good chance. It, it depends on the extent of the awakening she was able to generate for herself. So let's say that she immersed herself in reading spiritual literature. She took classes. She took workshops. She went on spiritual journeys of different kinds. If she really brought about a significant spiritual awakening through her own efforts, there's a very good chance the first accident and also, of course, the second and third would never have happened. So in your in your book, you talk about, I think a woman, her name was Jennifer, I think, who had two children who were disabled. And it seemed like she knew when she was here that she had, that, that this was the plan that she negotiated. And her hardships, she didn't see her children's disabilities as hardships. She saw them as lessons. Whereas some people would have seen those as hardships. What allows one person, a personality, 
to almost know their soul's plan versus some people, it seems like they're completely clueless to the fact that that's their soul's plan. Well, some of that I think has to do with soul age. I think older souls, uh, it's easier for them to remember what the pre-birth plan is. Younger souls get caught up in what is sometimes referred to as the glamour of the world, money, fame, things like that. They're really just distractions from what we're here to learn. But some of it also, I think, has to do with what uh, Jennifer, for example, planned into her life that allowed her to awaken uh, early enough so that she understood what was happening with her children. The story here for, for your listeners yeah. is that she has, she has two autistic children. One is severely autistic. The other one is mildly autistic. And in working with the mediums, what we found is that <clears throat> they both had a past life, the most recent past life, in Nazi Germany, where they worked in propaganda for the Nazis. So, in other words, they knew what the truth was, but they intentionally distorted it as part of the Nazi war effort. When they had their life review, they saw that they had done this. They didn't like that they had done this. And so they resolved to have a lifetime in which they would have experiences that would teach them the value of truthful communication. Well, by experiencing autism, which makes communication difficult, you come to understand very clearly how valuable communication is and can be. So, you know, when, after Your Soul's Plan first came out, uh, a review was posted on Amazon from a teacher who works with uh, autistic children. And she said in her review that Your Soul's Plan changed the way she looked at her students because previously she felt sorry for them, that they had to deal with autism. Now, having understood that it was part of a life plan, she viewed them as very, very courageous souls for taking on such a big challenge. She said it gave her complete respect for them that she'd never had before. And when I read that review, uh, I was very touched and gratified because that was exactly my intention in putting that story into the book. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like they now may be teaching her a lesson about compassion, which could have been her part of her soul's plan. That's a very good point, and I think that is one of the things she's learning from her, her two children. So what can you, can a person go, can I go now, meet with a medium, and find out what my pre-birth plan was, and am I learning what I'm supposed to be learning? So there are a number of ways to find out what you planned before you were born. Uh, I am a hypnotist, and I specialize in something that is called a between-life soul regression. The between-life soul regression, in my opinion, is the single most powerful way to find out what your life plan is. Now, you'll then say, well, why are your books based on sessions with mediums and channels and not hypnosis? Because I wasn't doing the hypnosis at the time I wrote the books. It's something I learned later on. Uh, briefly, what happens in a between lives regression is you go through a number of preliminary steps that are intended to help you relax physically and mentally. Then you go briefly into a past life, almost always a past life that had a big impact on the plan for the current lifetime. And then you leave the death scene in the past life and you cross back over to the other side. You go home, so to speak. When you get there, most people are greeted by a spirit guide. You talk to the guide briefly about why you were shown that past life. And then the guide takes you to what is called the Council of Elders. Mm -hmm. The Council consists of the very wise, loving, and highly evolved beings who oversee reincarnation on Earth. They know everything about you and everything about the plan for your current lifetime. So when you get in front of the Council, that is potentially a life-changing experience because if it's for your highest good, they can answer any question you put to them, including what did you plan, how are you doing in terms of fulfilling the plan, and what can you do to better fulfill your plan? Those are the kinds of questions they love to answer. And when you take someone through this, do you record what they say? Do they come back remembering what was talked about? Or how does like how do I make sure that I get all of that down? I record the interactive portion, meaning the conversation we have after the hypnotic induction ends. Okay. So when you're in front of the council, you would say to me, uh, Rob, uh, they're telling me this. And then I'll say, okay, in that case, let's ask them that. And we go back and forth like that. It's, it's a dialogue, a conversation. You will remember most of it on your own, but I'll give you the recording just in case. Wow. 
And then can you at that point talk with them about sort of renegotiating the plan or that had to be done before? That if you're going to do that, you should do that with the council while you're talking with them. And they are open to hearing that. You, you can say to them, I feel like my life is just too difficult. I'd like it to be easier. What can we do to make it easier? And you can have that kind of discussion with them. How long does one of these sessions typically take? Maximum of three hours. And the average session is somewhere between two and three. Holy cow. It's a long session. Yeah. And and when the person comes out of the hypnotic state, they typically remember. Is it a conversation like talking or is it more of like a clear, clear cognizant? experience it, it's it's clear audience on the part of the client so in other words if you were my client you would hear Which you would see the council after talking <laughs> to you, today. you you would most likely see the council but you would definitely hear them and you would tell me what they're telling you and then i would prompt you to ask the follow-up questions now i myself don't actually hear what the council is telling you you have to repeat it to me but okay. that's how we get it on the recording okay and do you do these for my listeners and for me personally? Do you do these in your? Do we come? Does someone have to come to you, or is this something that could be done telephonically? How does that work? Uh, you can come to me. I live in Ohio. If you want to, but over ninety nine percent of my clients do their sessions by either phone or Skype. It actually works just as well that way as it does in person. And for some people, I think it's better to do it by phone or Skype. Those are the people who will be more relaxed doing it from their own home because relaxation is the key to going into trance. Mm -hmm. So how did you stumble into this? I mean, I, I didn't want to start with this because the topic is so rich, but I'm really curious how you ended up here because this was not at all, I, I did read some, no, it, this was not at all in the realm of what you were doing. No, I, I was in the corporate world uh, until the age of 40. I have an MBA, which I think is probably quite a typical for the author of two New Age books. When I was in the corporate sector, I was very unhappy with my life and the work I was doing. It was tremendously unfulfilling and almost out of desperation, really. I went to a psychic medium, something I had never done before. wasn't even sure if I believed in mediumship. She started to channel my spirit guides. I didn't even know what a spirit guide was at the time. She explained these are highly evolved beings who are guiding you through this lifetime. And they started to speak through her, which I probably would have dismissed as some kind of delusion on my part, except that they knew everything about me without me telling them anything. So they were able to go through all of my major life challenges one by one without me telling them what those challenges had been and tell me why I had wanted before I was born to have those very difficult experiences. Well, as you can imagine, that rocked my world. And as I thought about it in the weeks after the session with the medium, the effect that it had on me is that it created a deep healing. Because for the first time, I was able to see a deeper meaning to the challenging things that had happened. Mm -hmm. And I thought, all right, I'm onto a concept here that can bring a similar kind of healing to other people. And that was when I first started down the road to writing Your Soul's Plan and Your Soul's Gift. You So this is what you do now, right? I mean, you travel the world. Yes, I have a, a workshop that is based on my two books. The, the focus of the workshop is helping people figure out what their life plan is. So I do this all over the U.S., all over the world, actually. Uh, there are four components to the workshop, a talk I give about pre-birth planning, an exercise I refer to as the Divine Virtues Exercise, which tells people which qualities they're working on in this lifetime, and then we do two group hypnotic regressions, one to contact a deceased loved one. The other is a group between life soul regression in which you can talk to the council and find out your life plan. So my, my time is divided essentially about a third for workshops and public talks, about a third for writing a new book. And the other third is private client work, which is almost entirely between lives regressions. And a between life regression differs from it, it's a it's a past life regression with the segment in between that life and returning to this current life. 
That's correct. But the past life portion of a between lives regression is actually a very small part of the session. Most of it is you talking to the council of elders. And that's the way we want it to be, because that's really the important part where you will find out what you planned and how you can best fulfill your plan. Well, this was just amazing and fascinating. And what is your next book? Are you, are you saying what it is? Uh, it will be about relationships. I, I'm not far enough into it yet to know specifically, uh, but that's the general topic. And do you feel like you channel spirits to help you or guides to help you do this work now? Or it really just, it, it's not a specific channeling experience. It just feels like it's how you live. You know, I, I'm not a medium or a channel in the sense of hearing non-physical beings talk to me. But when I write or when I do a private client session or when I'm doing a workshop, I'm very much aware of the fact that I'm just one member of a team. I happen to be the one member of the team who's in a body, who's moving his fingers over a keyboard or whatever it might be. But I know that there's a whole team there and that they have expertise in the areas in which I'm working. And even though I don't don't actually hear them speaking to me, I have no doubt that their ideas are getting through to me because without that, I don't think that I could do what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, can you just tell my listeners again where they can find you? We've, we've expanded what you could do. You can help them with their in-between life regression to help them understand their plan which I actually am thinking maybe I'll do and report back in a podcast what that experience was like for me, because I think that would be really interesting. Um, they can go to your website, yoursoulsplan.com. They can order your books on Amazon. They can sign up for your newsletter. Did I miss anything? Uh, the, the interesting page at yoursoulsplan.com is if you click in the main menu on schedule a session, that takes you to a page where you can read about the Between Lives Regression in great detail. And the lower half of that page is client accounts of their experiences in their session. That's the part that I think would probably be interesting to most people if they're not familiar with the Between Lives Regression. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time again today. And I greatly appreciate you educating myself and my listeners about this concept and helping us all hopefully continue to grow and evolve certainly towards love so thank you so much today like what you heard today and want to hear more curious about what comes next and what it all means you can subscribe on itunes just go to podcasts and find life death and the space between and hit subscribe and you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dr. Amy Robbins. Ask me any questions you might have. Let me know what else you'd love to hear about or just share your story. I can't wait to hear from you.